Well, we have been going through uh, a study of the life of Elijah in the book of 1 Kings uh, in the Old Testament. Now, I've got to give you a little bit of history uh, to the passage that we're getting to today before we get there. Um, But as I looked at and studied this passage, one of the things I was reminded of, uh, several years ago, I was at a, a pastor's conference, and the pastor who was speaking, that was kind of our main speaker at the pastor's conference, had actually himself gone through uh, a terrible time of depression and discouragement. And over that weekend, he kind of taught through this passage. And you'll see how this passage deals really clearly with those times that we find ourselves discouraged or in despair. And as I've looked at and studied this passage, it's amazing how many times I came across other pastors who in their notes on this passage, shared about their own times of discouragement and despair and how God really spoke to them through this. And I know this passage has been one that's been very significant in my life when I've faced times of discouragement. And so as we get to this part of the life of God's servant Elijah, it really does give us some answers to that question of how do you deal with discouragement? How does God show up for us when we're ready to give up and throw in the towel. So again, to set this story up, we have to go back. If you weren't with us last week, uh, last week we covered 1 Kings chapter 18, which is an amazing encounter that Elijah, this prophet of God, has with uh, this wicked king. There's a wicked king in Israel named Ahab, and his equally wicked wife Jezebel have been leading the people of Israel astray. They have been worshiping other gods. Baal is the primary god of the Canaanites of the time. And the Israelites have fallen into worship of Baal. And Elijah, through God's direction, sets up this kind of showdown at a mountain called Mount Carmel. And they're instructed to set up two different altars. And the prophets of Baal are going to call out to their God. And Elijah is going to call out to the God of Israel. And whichever God sends fire, that's going to be a declaration of who is truly God. And The prophets of uh, Baal go on and on for hours and hours, and nothing happens. And then Elijah steps up and says one prayer, and fire comes down and ignites that altar. And then the people who are gathered there rise up, declaring, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. And they take those prophets of Baal, and and they execute them. They kill them on the spot as this response and judgment against those that would worship Baal. And then Elijah tells King Ahab to to go back to his palace before rain comes. Uh, It's the end of a drought that has been declared by God. And so this drought ends. Ahab returns to uh, his winter palace, a a city called Jezreel. And so they go uh, to this place, Jezreel. Elijah goes uh, and meets up with them there. Actually, he gets there before Ahab does. And so that's where we pick up the story is Ahab has returned Uh, to his kind of summer kingdom, uh, summer palace in Jezreel, and is going to report to his wife, Jezebel, what has happened in this moment. And so Ahab returns. uh, Elijah's there also. Now, in this moment, what do you think Elijah is hoping for? What do you think Elijah is expecting? He's hoping for revival to break out, for repentance to come from Jezebel and Ahab, or maybe for the people to kind of rise up and overthrow them and return the nation of Israel to the worship of Yahweh, to the worship of the God of Israel. Well, let's see what happens. 1 Kings chapter 19 is where we're going to pick things up. Uh, So 1 Kings 19, verse 1, Ahab, again, the wicked king, told Jezebel, his wicked queen, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Ahab gives a report about everything that has happened. He gives the whole story, but the crowd, the altars, the fire, everything that happened, and with those prophets of Baal being killed. And what is Jezebel's response? It says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So what do we get from Jezebel, repentance, change, regret, I'm wrong, Elijah, your God is God. No, 
She's angry, and she responds in defiance and with a death threat. Basically, she says, Elijah, you took out some of my prophets. I'm taking you out. If by this time tomorrow, may may the gods curse me. And what she says here, may the gods deal with me ever so severely. That that is actually a, a common kind of curse formula that you see in the Bible. Sometimes people use that. Uh, as a statement of God at times, but in this case, she's talking about her gods, and it's a declaration of her intent to kill Elijah within 24 hours. This is not the response Elijah was expecting or hoping for. There's no change from those in power. There's not a big national revival that comes about in this moment. And so how does Elijah respond to this threat. Verses three and four. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die saying, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father. Elijah's response is to run in fear. Elijah gets out of town. And most translations say say he was afraid. Some say he saw or became aware of this threat. But he was afraid. He became aware that things were not going to work out the way that he thought they might. And he got up and he ran. Now remember, just not long ago, I mean, the same day probably, is when this declaration, this competition with Baal had happened and fire came down from heaven. God saw, or Elijah saw God work in an incredibly powerful way. And now this threat from Jezebel comes and he takes off running. And it says he ran to a place called Beersheba and that is a city in the kingdom of Judah. So he doesn't just run away, he runs to another kingdom not just another kingdom, but as far into that kingdom as he can possibly get. Here's a map. You can see Mount Carmel up at the top. They had gone to Jezreel. And then when Elijah takes off running, he bypasses Samaria, crosses the border into the kingdom of Judah to this city called Beersheba, which was on the southern edge of the kingdom of Judah. So he's getting about as far away as he can get and still be in the promised land. And he sits down under a broom tree. And he sends his servant away. And in that message of sending his servant away, I think within that is the message he's not planning on coming back. He's ready to give up on this prophet job that he's been doing. And he's ready to just move on uh, and and be away. It says he sat down under a broom tree. This is a a tree of a species called a juniper tree. This is not a beautiful big shade tree. This is basically a big bush that grows to about 12 feet tall. Uh, in this region. So if you're looking for shade, this isn't the ideal place, but it's what he's got. This is the bare minimum of shelter that he can find where he's at. And you can see he is experiencing tremendous discouragement in this moment. He is in the midst of despair. And his fear that prompted him to run wasn't a fear of dying. In fact, he asks God right here, God, take away my life. I think he was afraid of falling into the hands of Jezebel and what she might have done to him. He didn't see the big turnaround in Israel that he was hoping for. Things are not going the way that he thought they would go. And he's telling God, I'm done. You can just be done with me, God. Go ahead and take me out. You know, Elijah doesn't seek to take his own life in this moment, but he does say to God, God, bring me to an end. You know, sometimes discouragement can follow great times of emotional and spiritual experiences. I've experienced that in my life. I've seen it in the lives of others. You have a great, incredible experience, uh, kind of a spiritual high or a mountaintop kind of experience. And not long after that, because that's not sustainable, you can easily fall into discouragement and despair. And we see that happen here with Elijah. Spiritual attacks can frequently follow times of spiritual victory. And Elijah in this moment, this is not just a bad day. This is despair. 
I mean, look again at the words that he says. It is enough. I'm done. He says, now, O Lord, take away my life. Now, Elijah isn't the only servant of God to ever express those feelings. Numbers chapter 11. Moses is kind of fed up with the people that he has been leading. They're complaining about not having enough food, not having the food that they want. They're kind of rebelling against his leadership. Numbers chapter 11, we read this. Moses said to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? That you should say to me, carry them as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep before me and they say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. Do you hear the discouragement? the despair in what Moses is saying in that moment. Then Moses goes on and says, if you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I might not see my wretchedness. Moses experienced that same discouragement, that same despair when things were not going the way that he thought they would go. The Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he's told them this, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. The Apostle Paul says in the moment he despaired even of life. And you can find those kind of moments of despair and discouragement in the Psalms as well as you read through those. And these messages are significant for us because when we read those times that others have gone through, then when we face discouragement, we know that we are not alone. Others, even people of great faith that God used mightily, had times of discouragement and despair. And Elijah in this moment has done two things not to do when you're encouraging, when you're experiencing discouragement, depression, or despair. He isolates himself. He gets away from everybody else. And then he falls into self-pity. That last phrase, for I am no better than my father's. He feels like a failure. He's only seeing his failure in this moment. That's all he's looking at. He says, I am no better than my father's. My ministry will never amount to anything. My ministry has done no good. I haven't been able to get the people to turn to God even after this incredible miracle that I've seen. The results haven't been what he hoped they would be. So he sees himself as a failure. In our own lives and in our own ministries, God calls us to faithfulness, to be faithful to the call, the ministry, the place that he has called us to. God never promises that we'll see the results that we might want to see. God never promises that we'll see the success that we might hope for, but he does call us to faithfulness. Success and results are often out of our hands. Are you being faithful in your life to the things that you know God has called you to do? Be faithful and leave the results up to God. And so what does Elijah do next? It says that he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. So we see here a response from God. And the response that God gives him gives us a strategy for dealing with discouragement. And first off, we see that Elijah gets sleep. You know, sometimes a nap or a good night's sleep is the most spiritual thing you can do to help you out in whatever condition you're in. If you're facing discouragement, despair, just getting sleep, getting rest is incredibly important. And Elijah here, he's laying down on the hard ground 
under this little tree, and he sleeps. He gets the physical rest that he needs in response to the anxiety, the despair, the emotional and physical exertion that he's been under. And then after his sleep, he also gets some angelic encouragement. An angel shows up. Now, the word angel in Hebrew is the the word malak or messenger. And it's actually the same word that is used of the messenger that uh, Jezebel sent to him. He gets a messenger from Jezebel that is a threat of death. Then he gets a messenger from God that is one of hope and encouragement. And this angel doesn't correct him or condemn him or say, why are you afraid? It says, arise and eat. There's bread that has been provided for him, a freshly baked cake. There's your answer to depression and despair right there. Just have some cake. Works for me. Now, this phrase, the angel of the Lord, first it's identified as an angel, and then it says the angel of the Lord. And when you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, uh, many people describe this as what's being called a theophany, a visible manifestation of God's presence. Now, there are some who look at these pres- these appearances of the angel of the Lord and describe it as a, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Uh, and we don't know for sure that that's what's going on here, but when the angel of the Lord is described, uh, this is God's presence in a very physical form. And this presence is there with him. And Elijah gets spiritual encouragement at the same time he gets physical refreshment. We need spiritual encouragement when we're facing times of despair and discouragement, whether it's from God's word, whether it's from music that contains spiritual truth, whether it's time of prayer, time of praise, meditating on scripture, that spiritual encouragement is something that we need in those times of despair. And then, as I said, he gets food and drink. Sitting right there is this freshly baked cake and a jar of water. And this is a a step up from how God has provided for Elijah. If you remember, there was one point where he was getting fed by ravens that were bringing him meat and bread. This is like freshly baked bread that is there for him. Just as God has provided for Elijah in the past, he is providing here for Elijah's physical needs. And then he takes another nap. Does he get some more sleep? And then the angel wakes him again and says that Elijah will will go on a journey. Now, there's a lot of unanswered questions in this passage. There's a lot of things in this passage that are open to a, a variety of interpretations. You know, what journey is the angel talking about? Is Elijah being guided by God on where he's going next? Or does Elijah keep running on his own? We don't know what prompts the destination for where Elijah is going, but we do know where he goes next. And so Elijah's next part of his journey, verse 8, it says, And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And when you see this phrase, the mountain of God, of God. Uh, You might not recognize the name Horeb, uh, but the mountain of God is also known by another name, the name Sinai. And this is called the mountain of God in scripture. This would be the mountain where Moses met with God, where the Ten Commandments were given. Now, it should not have taken Elijah 40 days to make this journey. And so along the way, he took longer than he really needed to to get there. We don't know if he just made lengthy stops along the way or if he kind of wandered about in the land the same way the Israelites had done uh, before coming to the mountain. But he takes this journey south from Beersheba all the way across what's called the Sinai Peninsula uh, down to this area where Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai is. This is a desolate place. This is a dry, rugged, mountainous region. This would not have been the ideal place to go to get rest or refreshment. But that's where he goes. And it says, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, why does God ask Elijah, what are you doing here? You know, when God asks a question, it's not because he needs information. It's because he's wanting us to think about whatever that question is. Is this a criticism of Elijah? Is God telling Elijah that he's not where he wants him to be? 
Uh, most likely, this is a challenge of introspection to challenge Elijah to, to examine his motives for where he's at right now and what he is doing. And then look at Elijah's response. <clears throat> he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now here's the way I really think Elijah said this. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. The people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets. I, even I, am the only one left, and they seek my life to take it away. I think that's how Elijah is saying this. His complaint has some truth to it, but he's taking it all on himself. And there's kind of a hidden accusation that God hasn't done his part. Elijah's saying, I've done everything right. I'm the only one left. He isn't thinking rationally in this moment. He's forgetting about all the times that God has shown up for him and provided for him and led him and guided him. You know, in times of discouragement, we are tempted to only see the immediate circumstances. We forget about the past and ways God has provided for us. We don't see a future that's going to get any better. And Elijah feels alone because he had isolated himself. You know, even though he didn't have to be alone, he was alone. At times in our discouragement or despair, we can reinforce our own isolation and loneliness by not seeking out fellowship with others. Elijah has isolated himself in this moment. And then God in his grace is going to continue speaking to Elijah. And Elijah is going to hear from God a very specific message and very specific instructions for him. God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he's given this instruction to go out and stand on the mountain, to stand before the Lord. And God is going to pass by Elijah, just as he did for Moses on this same mountain, very likely in the same spot as we read about in Exodus 33 and 34. But for Elijah, there is going to be a great wind, so strong a wind it's going to bring down parts of the mountain and break the rocks apart. And then there's going to be an earthquake that comes and shakes the mountain, and then a fire. But God is not going to speak to him through any of those things. Now, were those things there by God's sovereignty? Yes, absolutely. But God is not speaking a specific word through those things. Now, here's one the thing that's interesting here. Each one of these things is a way that somewhere in Scripture, God does reveal himself, and God does speak to others. He had shown up in fire on Mount Carmel. God made his presence known through fire for the people of Israel. When Moses met at the mountain of God with the people, there had been an earthquake. There are times in Scripture where God does speak through a powerful wind, and make himself known these ways. So the message here isn't that God doesn't speak through those things. It's in this moment, God is trying to teach Elijah, don't just look for me among the spectacular things. Listen for my quiet voice at times. God doesn't have to reveal himself in only one way. Sometimes there will be ways that God works in power. Sometimes it's a quiet voice that we need to listen for. And it says, Elijah wrapped his face, stood at the cave opening, and heard this voice. And I think it's interesting. It says Elijah had to go and stand on the cave. Like he had retreated back into the cave while all this stuff was going on outside. And then there's this gentle voice, this gentle whisper. 
and he comes and hears that. But the first thing that God speaks is the exact same question he had asked him before. What are you doing here, Elijah? Think about your purpose, your motivations. Where are you at? What are you doing here? Look at what Elijah said. I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah gives the exact same answer. Now, we don't know if anything has changed in his attitude, but he doesn't feel like his conditions have changed yet. He's still operating with a limited understanding and limited information. But God isn't finished speaking. God's going to give Elijah his next mission, saying, Elijah, I am not done with you. There are some other things that you need to go do. And the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. This would be 150 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So he's sending him back the way he came and then sending him farther on for something else to do. He says, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Now, Hazael wouldn't actually become king of Syria for a while. This is kind of like Samuel anointing David as king long before he actually became king. And Hazael, the king of Syria, this is a, a pagan king who would actually be used by God to bring further judgment on the people of Israel for their continued disobedience and idolatry. God goes on and says, And a Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. Now, it would also be quite a while before Jehu would become king. And Jehu would be the one who would bring a lot, an end to the family line of Ahab. And then there's one more assignment. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. God is raising up another prophet, Elisha, who will join Elijah in service and who will eventually take Elijah's place. God goes on and gives more information. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. The one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. But God is saying right here, judgment is still coming on those who are wicked, on those who turn from God, on those who lead people astray. Now there's a challenge within this that in Scripture we never see these exact things happen. Now that doesn't mean they didn't happen. Just because something isn't recorded in Scripture doesn't mean it didn't happen. But we do see a future anointing of Hazael by Elisha and a future anointing of Jehu by another prophet. Now maybe Elijah had gone and anointed them or declared that they would be king and then these other prophets are sent to kind of reinforce and confirm what Elijah had revealed to him in this moment. Uh, but Elisha will become Elijah's kind of assistant for a while and mentor, and he will mentor Elisha until God moves him on. But then God also says, uh, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. And this is a reminder that Elijah is not really alone. Elijah is not the only one left. He is not the last prophet that is serving God. There are 7,000 that God declares have not fallen into the worship of Baal. There are people who are still faithful. Even when you feel like you are in the minority, whether it's in a place of work, a school, within your family, some situation that you are in, where you feel like you are alone, know that you can still find other believers that can encourage you. If you are in isolation, loneliness, despair, discouragement, find others to connect with. Stay in fellowship with other believers. That's why the scripture is very clear. Don't give up meeting together. Don't isolate yourself from other believers, especially when you're feeling discouraged. Unfortunately, I have seen many people drift away from the faith. And many times it begins with isolating themselves from other believers. 
when you find yourself in a place of discouragement, are you taking care of yourself physically? Are you getting rest, getting sleep, getting healthy food, getting some time away? Are you seeking spiritual encouragement, going to God in honest prayer, seeking truth from God's word for encouragement? Are you seeking out fellowship with other believers, people that you can be honest with and open with about the discouragement and the despair that you might be facing, but people that you can go to to find encouragement? And if someone comes to you and says they're having a really hard time with something, listen, speak truth and love, offer encouraging words. Sometimes the most important thing we can do for somebody in despair and discouragement is just be there with them. And when you are facing discouragement, remind yourself of what God has done for you in Christ. There's an author by the name of Jerry Bridges, and in one of his books, he says something that I think is a great truth for all of us to put into practice, which is he says, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Remind yourself of the good news of what Christ has done for you. Remind yourself that in your sin, you were separated from God, but God in his love for you sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life, to die a death on a cross in our place, to demonstrate his love for us through Christ so that when we put our faith and trust in Christ, we can receive that gift of eternal life. That is the good news of what Christ has done for us. That is a great cure for discouragement and despair is to remind yourself, preach that good news to yourself every day, that God's love for you, that God's plans for you are not based on your current circumstances, are not based on what you're doing, are not based on your own efforts, but are based on his love for you and his purpose and his plan that he continues to have for you, whatever circumstances that you find yourself in. Preach the gospel to yourself every day to remind yourself of God's love and plan and purpose for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes this, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. We find encouragement from the mercy and the grace of God. Whatever your circumstances or your situation right now, God has a next mission for you just like he did for Elijah. Whether that's continuing on in a ministry that you are already involved in, or maybe it's getting involved in a new or a different ministry, God doesn't want you on the shelf. He's saying to Elijah here, I'm not done with you. I've still got things that you need to be doing. And God continues to say that for us. He never is done with us until that last breath that we take. Maybe you are in a discouraging situation right now. My prayer is for you to find hope and encouragement from this story. Maybe this story causes you to reflect back on a time when you experienced this kind of despair or discouragement, and you can respond with gratitude for the grace and the strength that God provided to get you through that time and to sustain you. Or maybe hearing this today is preparation for a future time that you will face discouragement. Remember in those times that you are not alone. Remember the times that God has provided for you. Remind yourself of his great love for you. Stay in fellowship with other believers. Trust that God will speak into your life with hope and encouragement. And may we be people that can bring hope and encouragement to others when they are in despair and discouragement. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the life of your servant Elijah. Scripture tells us that he was a man just like us. And we see that in this story that we look at this morning as well. That even though he went from times of, of great spiritual highs, he also had moments of despair and discouragement. And Father, each one of us can fall into those moments as well. So I do pray 
for anyone this morning that is feeling discouraged, that they would find encouragement from the truth of your word, that they would find encouragement from fellowship with other believers, that you would give them grace to get the rest, the physical encouragement that they need as well. And Father, we thank you for your great love for us, that even in our times of despair and discouragement, that you give us grace, that you remind us of your love and care for us, that you remind us of all that you have done for us in Christ. And so, Father, I pray as we leave this place today, that you would use us as your instruments to bring hope and encouragement to a world that is full of darkness and despair at times, that you would help us bring light and hope to those around us, that we would be reminded daily of your great love for us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I'd ask that you stand uh, as I send us out with a benediction uh, from the book of Ephesians chapter 3. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Thank you for being with us this morning. Go and have a great week of honoring our God. Free.